Okay, class, welcome to another session. Um, and I'm really, really excited today. Our guest speaker is Roger Palmer. Um, and he started a, a website and has built a pretty sizable following on social media. Um, the website is called What's on Disney Plus. And so obviously by the, the name, you could tell what the website's about, um, what his content is about. And so he's here today to, to give us a background and talk about his fandom with Disney, uh, but then also to kind of get into to some deeper conversations about what is Disney Plus, what has it done, how has it performed, and how has it performed and helped people during the global pandemic. Um, so without further ado, without me talking too much more, um, Roger, welcome to the class and the show. And if you could give us some background on how you got into Disney, um, and that, that's parks, movies, whatever, yeah. um, and then walk us up to today, where you are today. Thank you. Yep. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so I pretty much, as like probably most of you, kind of got into Disney since I was a kid. Um, always there. I mean, there's pictures of me of like three years old with my Spider-Man action figures and my Muppets t-shirt, you know, right way back as far as I can remember. Um, we ended up going out to Florida, I think um, when I was about like nine, and then we went a number of times out to America and stuff, and that kind of just keep building on it. And I think at that point, you know, growing up in the 80s and the 90s, you know, Marvel, Star Wars, weren't technically Disney at the time, so you didn't really connect to, but always liked Disney, always, I uh, was always connected, always loved the parks. And I think it was more the parks as a teenager and stuff and kind of got into it. Um, and then probably for in my twenties kind of drifted off a little bit, but I always, um, I'd always go to the parks if I could. Um, I did a lot of traveling in my twenties and went to all the theme parks all over the place. I um, would always, you know, jump into a theme if I could. And then probably uh, about and I was always into the movies, the video games. It was just one of those things. It was just, I always liked that kind of, like, you know, the movies. And especially with Pixar, when that kind of picked up with the, um, with their animation and stuff. And then once they brought Marvel and Star Wars, it kind of really ramped up. Because then you suddenly had so many more things that I liked in with the Disney side. And then it was probably about 2011 or so, um, ended up writing i mean i've been doing websites on and off mainly about wrestling actually um since i was like 19 since i was at college doing computers and so when i was about 10 years ago started writing uh, for a website vinomation kingdom about little these little vinomation disney figures that you could only buy at the theme parks mm -hmm. i spotted them when i was out we were out in new york and was just writing about them and we were just writing about them for a website and gradually over time i ended up doing more of the website and um the guy that was running it he went off to run start he was leave he span off popvinyls.com or obviously the funko ones so he was doing that more and i kind of ended up doing the the vinylation side and then we ended up one of the guys started getting into disney infinity the video game and with all the little figures and stuff and so we started covering that and that blew up matt we were getting we were really like just full-on deep diving into disney infinity they loved the game you know we were featured on the you know I was getting in the top class, top games every month and all the rest of it. And it was like, we were growing from that there. From that back then, we then kind of spun that off into Diz Kingdom because we kind of wanted to branch out a little bit because we felt like the Vinomation Kingdom wasn't really making a lot of sense name-wise. So I, we started that off and that was covering everything in Disney. But it got to a point where I was, to be in all honesty, I'd stretched myself a bit too thin. I was trying to cover two, because Disney just kept growing. Disney was just growing, you know, covering the parks, the cruises, the movies, the video games, the toys. It was getting to the point where it was like, I didn't have enough time of the day to cover it all because there was just there's so many aspects of Disney, so many aspects. And so I decided to sort of stream down a little bit into like niche onto collectibles and was doing that for a while. And, but also at the same time, it, it felt a little bit like collectibles were kind of dipping in, in um, people were kind of dropping off of it. You know, you could sense that, you know, that that kind of business is kind of people aren't so into it anymore. I think, there's, to be honest, I think they over did saturated the market. Vinomation has been killed off. Disney Infinity been killed off. So we were kind of at a point where our main things had kind of gone off. So it was actually I started What's on Disney Plus uh, probably not far off three years ago. 
And you may be thinking Disney Plus only launched um, like not even 18 months ago, but I actually had already started planning it way before when Bob Iger said in an investor's call, because I used to listen to them every quarter um, for the information about the finance and stuff. So I'd actually started up a streaming site um, about the Disney streaming, about this new thing. And I was kind of incorporating a bit of Hulu and stuff, but it was like, okay, I think this would be like maybe the next project. Cause I love watching the movies. I love watching all the TV series. And I'd kind of was like, this could be a nice little side project to kind of go off. And then he announced Disney plus and I instantly went in, changed the website name, changed everything over. So I'd already had essentially like a year's worth of articles already there. So it wasn't like it was just like, you know, like I just had to, you know, I decided this you know, f- nearly three years ago now. So it was, it's been a long project. And then from there, I was building it up and doing articles on everything for nearly a year before what's on Disney Plus launched a year before Disney Plus did. You know, I mean, we'd, I'd read a weekly podcast. You know, we started that back in like Nove- November 2019, oh, sorry, 2018, sorry. You know, we were we were doing episodes and people were going what are you doing this for what it's not out for a year it's not why are you doing it it's not you know it's not coming for another year yet so we were i was way 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 ahead of it launching and that's why i think by the time it came to launch we were already in that position of of being established as far as like you know we'd got some fans we got every time there was big announcements people were drawn to us because we were already there and i think that was the key thing we were i'd built it two years before it launched so therefore we were in a completely different situation and then i've just kept building on it um and then yeah it's just it's absolutely you know the site is completely where above where i thought it would ever be i mean in all honesty it was a hobby and it's just it's so much bigger than i ever imagined i, I still can't believe you know the following that we have and the amount of people that read it and it just doesn't it doesn't make any sense to me <laughs> honestly i'm still on that point of you know it's always been a, a hobby and the idea of it being something that, you know, I literally know is pretty much, you know, this last year has been a bit weird because of the whole lockdowns and being forced to stay home for months on end and being kind of not being able to do my real life job. It's kind of essentially meant I've been able to spend most of the year doing this kind of full time, but by accident. So it's like, so that's kind of been really helpful in some ways, I think, of establishing you know, I, of what I'm doing because I've had that time. So everything has kind of... I mean, I, I just, it's luck, but um, that's the way I look at it. There wasn't, I, there was no big foresight of how it was all going to work. But I think that's kind of for me of just a lot of time, a lot. I mean, I, I can put in 10, eight to 10 hours a day doing the site, sometimes even 12 hours. The investor's day last, I worked, I think I did about 16 hours that day. <laughs> I got three hours sleep. <laughs> I was just like, I'm going, yeah, this is maybe not so good. <laughs> the- well, and, and and thank you for that introduction. And and you you're talking about the the foresight to you were already writing about streaming, um, and then the, you know I remember the announcement when this new service, this new sit, uh, streaming service, was going to come. Didn't know the name of it. Yeah. Um, and then I, I've I've listened to Bob Iger's book many times. Yeah. Um, where he, t- and there's a chapter in there where he talks about Disney plus yeah. and he talks about rather than being disrupted, like they were previously, they're basically disrupting their own model. And so the, the foresight of seeing what was coming, um, is incredibly impressive, um, for, from the company's perspective. And the, the, that that goes with you as well. I mean, the, the foresight to, yeah, you say it, it's it's some luck with what's happening now and everything, but you were set up to where when it launched, you already had the presence, you already had the people or, and the content and the people who were reading and the fans. Um, and then, you know, like we talked about before we started recording, I mean, Disney Plus launched, and, and four months later, everybody's staying at home. And that's when they are starting to launch in other countries. Um, like, uh, like you said, when, when they launched in the UK, it was, it was right at the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, literally, the UK launched, at, like, the week after 
the we all went into lockdown and because people were begging Disney going, please can you just start it early? And they're like, and you can sort of them going, Yeah, when we can't quite do that. <laughs> Not quite going to switch a switch and turn on. But yeah, I mean perfect timing. I mean, everyone being at home for the year. I mean, so many people, but I mean, essentially you've got all these kids at home with nothing to do with with Disney Plus there. I mean, it was perfect timing. And I mean, just recently they um did an article looking at like the top t- uh, movies of the year and the data that had come through and Disney had like seven or eight of the top 10 movies um, because kids just watching it on repeat mm-hmm. and repeat and, re- and you see it in the trending chart every single week the same you know, people go well why is Moana still in the top five because well, kids just keep watching it <laughs> yeah <laughs> I mean and that and, had a massive impact and what you know you say you say kids at home um watching disney plus all the time i am guessing that that also refers to um almost almost 40 year olds kids watching disney plus as well because i i i watch it every day um not not all day every day but i i think since it has launched there's been um i i've at least watched a few minutes here and there during the day whether it's with my kids my family whether it's um, you know having it on in the background or something like that, um, so the when when they launched and, and by the way I you just re- the numbers you referred to I I saw that um, that you had posted about it, it was eight of the ten I think yeah. of the movies that were Disney Plus, and then you you flip that around and you look at the original content. Yeah. Um, and it was nine of the 10 were Netflix. Yeah. Because that is the established brand. And we kind of talked about how Disney was projecting to actually be a serious competitor with Netflix much f- further down the road, much yeah, farther down they, the road than, than now. They were looking, I think they were looking at 60 to 90 million subscribers by 2024 was the initial estimate that they put out at the Investors Day um, in 2019. I keep saying last year, but it's not. I um, mean, 2019. And I think it was a little bit low, but I think they were being very, they were being cautious. They didn't mm-hmm. know what was going to happen. They didn't know if it was going to catch. And obviously it did. I mean, they've now brought up to, I think they want like 250, 330, 350 million by 2024 globally on all of their platforms. And they just, I mean, the, the way that they've come about and just been like, we're completely changing, you know, when Bob Chapek comes out and says, we're going to completely change the company around streaming and we're completely just stripping out the TV model that we've had for years and calling it legacy and getting rid of this department and changing this and merging this company. And I mean, everything they've done has just been about streamlining because they realized, I mean, I think they, they were tippy-toeing, you know, it was always a bit like, no, there's the Disney Channel and there's the FX Channel and ABC and all of that. But we don't, just, we, you know, they're still the television. They, you know, you guys are over here and you can we'll see what you can do. And of course, now it's like, it's like, yeah, we need to be over here. You guys, we need to sort you lot out because you need to. And it's a complete like U turn from where they, and you would never have imagined it. I mean, I was um, just looking at recently at some data of like the networks, the television networks they're down massively, mm-hmm. massively down on la- on last year, even in a pandemic. I mean, the Disney Channel was down like 33% on last year. Um, I think ABC was the only one that didn't do as bad, but it was still like five, seven, eight percent something like that. And it's like every network, television network is down, even in a pandemic when we're all at home. I mean, that's just crazy to think about it. Yeah, and you know, it was, the the future was streaming, has been for a few years, um, but based on what the world is going through now, what people are going through now, I mean, it's just, it's now, it's not the future anymore. It is the present and, and that's where everything is. And one thing that has been so interesting to me about Disney plus, and when we, when we've talked in the class or I've talked to other people about it is this idea that there are very few companies that could launch a streaming service based solely on their content and be as be as the set up to be as successful as Disney because of the content they have from animation 
from live action and then from all of their, their acquisitions that they've made. Um, that even in the first year and that, that data where it says nine of 10 um, original shows, uh, uh, nine of the top 10 original shows as far as um, numbers, minutes watched was Netflix. Well, that also, I, I think that also says that within the first year, Disney Plus really didn't have, <laughs> they had a lot of original content, but they didn't yeah. have Star Wars. They didn't have Pixar. They didn't have Marvel. They didn't have anime. And all of that's coming now. Yeah, you know? to me, um, the problem with tw- the problem with 2020 in terms of content was they did have, um, so they had some knockbacks. I mean, things like Falcon and the Winter Soldier should have been out in August. Mm-hmm. They got pushed back because of filming stopped. I think the problem was they had a wobble in February. In March, in January and February last year, they had a wobble with like Love Victor and High Fidelity, which they shifted over to Hulu because they got scared that it was too, that they kind of Disney Plus has become this babysitting service. Mm-hmm. And they got a little bit like caught up in it being everything being very, very friendly, friendly, nothing to alienate anybody. And they kind of pulled them off. And so that basically meant that we went from the Mandalorian in like December right up till October for the right stuff being the only mainstream uh, drama series we had uh, was it Diary of a uh, Future President in the middle but that was kind of a yeah. Disney Channel show so we had went essentially 10 months without what I would call a mainstream drama series and I don't think enough people watched the right stuff because I thought it was great but there wasn't anything we had 10 we had 10 months of nothing there was nothing to watch and that hurt I mean there was just there was nothing and a lot of the decisions they'd been making for some of the originals weren't hitting the weren't hitting the mark. I could I could you could tell what ones were popular and which ones weren't because you know you know they put a trailer up or I'd put up an article or I'd see it in our Facebook group. I mean we're at like one hundred and fifty five thousand members in our Facebook group, so I know very quickly what is popular and what isn't. And these mm-hmm. shows just weren't moving the needle. You know nobody was asking about them. Nobody was mentioning them. Uh, no matter you know, if you were asking them a question about them, nobody was really because re- they weren't resonating, you know, because mm-hmm. it was too much documentary, too much filler. Though, and because they were being safe, everything was being. I think they went a little bit too safe, and it suffered. I and mean, I think that's you know, they, they you know, it was show after show of just like, oh, this is just average. It's just not. It's not good enough. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially when we're all at home wanting proper TV. Twenty twenty one, the lineup is so different. I mean, it's just night and day. Um, but yeah, the 2020 lineup was very, very, it was very average with a few good exceptions. Well, and I, I think, you know, some of that was, or I should say a lot of that was planned because as you talked about, they, they were kind of tiptoeing around to see how things worked out and everything. Um, and then obviously uh, when everything shuts down and they can't, they can't start filming because I, I believe um falcon and the winter soldier and wandavision was going to come out in 2020 right i well, believe wandavision, wandavision wandavision was a bit odd because it, it kind of they always had said right from the word go that it was coming in 2021 okay um okay. so it's kind of one of those things because i would had this argument a number of times in the group i think and online of like people saying it's like yeah they did say it was going to come out in, in 2021 then they said 2020 a little bit later on and then it was and it's like well to be honest they the only thing really was Falcon. Falcon missed the slot completely. Yeah. And therefore, but One Division was pretty much always around this time. Okay. Okay. And so, you know, some of the things that they, they did, I, it, it seems like 2021, when you release those numbers again next year, um, those numbers are going to look very different because everyone every property or I should say every brand, every studio experienced the, the lockdown almost yeah. the same way. Um, they had to be locked down for, you know, for months. Um, so you're going to see every company kind of trying to deal with that. And, and I, I just, I feel like in 2021 with the amount of content and original content that's going to come out um there's there's a those figures are going to look a lot different is that accurate 
Well, I mean, just, I mean, you look at like Marvel alone. I mean, they've got five drama series, plus they've got the What If animated series. So there's five series that could potentially be on the top 10 lists mm-hmm. of the year. Whether or not they all do, we don't know. But five, I mean, I'd be happy if I'd had one or two of them a year. That would have been nice. But five, even on there, was, it's like, they got five out. That doesn't, mm-hmm. that, that seems a lot, especially on a weekly schedule. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're going to be like, I'm, I'm hoping we don't end up getting a bit burnt out there. But, you know, with that, and then you're going to have the Book of Boba Fett. And then we've got other series that, you know, that they, the Disney ones, you know, things like the Big Shot, uh, the Mighty Ducks, the, uh, there's a few other series as well that they're kind of throwing as, you know, they've all got potential. There's so much more. And if they're all weekly, it's going to completely change everything up a bit. And we know we've gone from essentially two shows in 2020 to now maybe a dozen, yeah, maybe more. That's yeah. a big, big jump. And now with every, you know, the, also what happened during all of this is um, I think Disney did a very good job of releasing a lot of the movies that either, like if we're looking at Onward, uh, it opened in theaters two weeks before lockdown. Um, it was, they sped everything up. So I think um, April 1st may have been when it released on yeah. Disney+. Plus. Um, and Frozen 2, they sped up the kind of that, that gap between theatrical release yeah. and, and streaming. Um, so that was in the United States, that was the first weekend when everybody, when it was announced, okay, starting this day, I think it was a Sunday, everybody's going to be in lockdown. Um, that Friday prior to that is when Frozen launched or uh, Frozen was yeah. released on Disney Plus. And, you know, they did that with those, they did that with, Artemis Fowl because they they couldn't have it in the theaters. They did it with um, they they did it with Hamilton, okay. which was yeah. was a really really big deal. And you had all of these companies that all of these studios that were having to to find a way to kind of deal with the the loss of brick and mortar theaters for much of 2020 and into 2021. Um, that I think the companies that had the streaming services and had the content set up, they were in a really, really good position. Mm. How do you think um, Disney releasing movies and releasing content that was supposed to be in theaters, how do you think that helped the brand during the pandemic? And also how would it have helped the fans? I think primarily... I think mainly it would have been about the fact that it needed, they just needed content, especially with the thing of Falcon being gone. We had a little bit of a spell where there obviously we weren't, we weren't having any drama. And if you look at like Frozen 2 dropping in was massive. Um, that dropped in three months early. In the UK, they had to hold on to it for a few, a uh, couple of reasons. Same thing with Onward. I mean, we didn't get it to like October. So those two movies were enough probably just to prop up like each month. You know, April, that was fine. Artemis Fowl was probably one of those things of um, they had to do something to keep Disney Plus going. They saw the numbers going up, so they knew that the money was coming in and there was no way of them releasing it. So it made sense for them to do it, especially that probably movie would have bombed at the cinema anyway. Um, it being realistically, it wouldn't have done very well. And so they, they made the best of it. Um, Hamilton was a massive move, um, but it made sense because essentially you've got something that's been that's a few years old Sat in, a, sat in a vault, not supposed to come out for another year, and it's there. And mm-hmm. at the time, it was like, we've got all this stuff. I mean, the, the, the 2021 film lineup was, was just becoming bigger and bigger. They weren't going to have any... And it, I mean, it was a massive hit to get that in in July, right in the summer. It was a huge... And it paid. I mean, it, they had the mm-hmm. biggest spike in downloads. They removed the free trial, so mm-hmm. that showed you yeah. that was the thing of right. We're at a point now where we can't, we don't need to do the free trial anymore. Hamilton was a massive, big kind of shoot in the arm, and also it was what I would refer to at the time of. It felt as if Disney suddenly gone. Right, Disney Plus isn't quite so. It doesn't have to be just a babysitting service mm-hmm. anymore. We can start kind of pushing the boundaries a little bit. Um, Hamilton kind of was hoping that that was that kind of thing of going. Oh. You know, we were getting something a little bit more. Um, and then I think that was, you know, and I mean, something like right stuff as well, kind of falls mm-hmm. in that line of going, these are not kids shows. They're not meant for kids. They aren't, you know, they're not just for them. So Hamilton was a big hit. 
the one and only Ivan was a little was a, it was a really it was a nice solid movie, and the the, the Phileas and Ferb movie that kind of those movies just kind of helped fill it out. And obviously mm-hmm. as well, Disney then went out and brought a load of movies like uh, Black Beauty and Clouds, which helped kind of yeah. bulk out the the full. Um, which are two re- really great. Um, Clouds is a fantastic movie. Um, definitely recommend people check that one out. And and then they've just and then they I think they're able to finish off Godmother and Safety just to kind of get them out for Christmas. Yeah. So, and then obviously we have the whole new land thing. <laughs> and you know, you of those of those movies, um, I I have yet to see Clouds, um, the Phineas and Ferb movie, um, but. We um, we just got finished. Well, during the Christmas holiday, watching uh, Godmother, um, yeah. I watched Safety. The there, you know, Safety is a really good kind of that feel good movie. Um, and you mentioned the right stuff, and I think that was or is quite an underrated show. That is amazing. Yeah, I, I didn't watch it when it first came out. I, I watched it maybe week four or five. So I kind of had that four or five week binging experience. And then by the time I reached the end of episode five, I'm like, all right, I've got to wait another week for six, seven and eight, you know. Yeah. Literally, the right stuff is the only show that me and my wife have watched off Disney Plus together. Mm-hmm. That kind of states a thing of like, that was something that she would watch. I mean, she generally watches the movies with me. But I have I watch all the originals, so it's just you know that's just kind of what I have. It's what I do. Mm-hmm. So I I do watch them. I don't necessarily enjoy all of them. Some of them, you know, it's I mean we had like Star Girl and Timmy Ferrier, which is easy to forget about. Um, but you know those kind of movies weren't weren't right. And then like I said, Safety for me was a movie of like oh, that's about American football. I don't know about American football. I really don't care about American football. I'm not interested. Watched it wasn't about American football, and it was like. Okay, these are the kind of movies that just weren't, you know, they never get released over here in the UK anyway mm-hmm. because there's no interest. But it's those kind of movies that they can only put on Disney Plus because the market mm-hmm. isn't there at the cinema anymore. But Disney loves to make them, they're generally cheaper to make. Um, and that kind of fills that void, really. And so, yeah, safety was a definite highlight that I wasn't expecting. And yeah. Clouds was, again, was a much more serious movie, you know, a, a kid that's getting cancer. And you could tell it wasn't a Disney movie, it was a bit more edgy and you know and it's not for kids and i you know those those kind of the 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 fall was was very strong for movies yeah yeah and the um just it's hard to you talking you you naming the original shows now it just makes me remember oh i forgot about that one i forgot about that one oh i liked that one i i Yeah. yeah i forgot about that show i forgot about that movie um and you know again when i have to write about them as much as i do <laughs> which or if you how many times you have to say on the weekly video of like and here's another one day at disney short <laughs> <laughs> and well, th- that's another series that one day at disney that was oh. that was incredible that and the imagineering story yeah see i put them on two very different pedestals yeah imagineering story was amazing it yes. was probably one of the yes. best things you can find if you love your theme parks like i do it was amazing i mean i i remember like we were sat um we were in uh, we we're at hong kong disneyland and we were watching the episode of hong kong disneyland when it dropped oh yeah and i was watching it on um, and i was just like you know and like there was like we were there today and they, they did the shanghai one and we just come back from there and we were literally on the trip at the time when those episodes were dropping and it was just like this is amazing you know, so much history and and then the one day at Disney Shorts, I'm going to be honest, it felt a bit like um, a human resources. <laughs> so I just, um, it, I get sometimes some of the things don't quite translate as well internationally. Yeah. And some of the things of like how, in some ways, how Americans will present stuff doesn't necessarily translate as well internationally. And that show was one of just like, yeah, this just feels like a PR, like a human resources. Pe- and yeah, I wasn't so keen on that one. I'll be honest. <laughs> well, and and for for me, I um, I got that book, the coffee table book, one day at Disney for Christmas, and and I think you know it kind of goes through those those people, um, and so yeah, the <clears throat> not trying to put the two on the same 
level because the imaginary story is yeah I, if they came out with 10 seasons of that i would probably watch every show four or five times in that um that's actually that's something in the class that uh the students watch when we talk about the thing, the is, the thing is as well with that series that is that was what was made to stand out was it and it's rare for disney because they told about the failures they mentioned mm -hmm. what went wrong they mentioned what didn't work what didn't and it's rare that disney does that and that's what i think took it at that next level of a little bit of self-critique a little bit of being honest rather than it being like a fluff piece and that was the difference i feel for that show yeah it was it was just amazing i i, I really really enjoy that show um so i mean there there's I feel like I have probably a thousand questions about all of this that, that I, I'm not sure I'm able to properly formulate, but overall, um, it, it, Disney plus has, has, I guess Disney plus has been around longer than one year. Um, kind of since it's initial launch, it's launched in most <clears throat> countries by now, most markets by now. Um, so far, how would you rate their performance? Just overall, like from revenue perspective, subscribers, and then kind of the fan experience. I think from like a business point of view, I mean, they've done fantastic. I mean, we're at, what is it? The last financial results were at like 86.9 million subscribers. Just amazing. And they've still got so many more countries to go. So that's, I mean, that's been amazing. The the way they've built it up, the way they've focused on it, you know, like literally in the car today, you know, you got adverts for One Division. There's bus buses with all the Christmas um, things that were on it. You know, there's TV adverts. They're promoting it. It's just done amazing, and you can okay. sense, you know, and the, the weekly drops and the big things that they're dropping on it are starting to make that impact. You know, when I've got people shouting to me, you know, when I went to buy a car the other day and I had a, a Baby Yoda mask on. You know, and the and the staff in there, and we know having four of us talking about Baby Yoda and the Mandalorian in a car showroom, or a builder shouting to me, mm -hmm. like, "Have you seen the latest episode of the Mandalorian?" You know, this is where that thing of it going mainstream, and that's what you know. That's where I think they've done a fantastic job with that, and I think this year will be a lot better with the Marvel shows and more Star Wars and just a, a few bigger hits. Um, I do think we've had a we had a lot of growing pains on that on the on that service this year um the finding i would say the biggest thing was finding the tone they went a little bit too safe and then there was a blowback obviously with um the hillary duff situation with the whole um, lizzie mcguire show being too mature that kind of set people up wrong and then kind of adults starting to go hold on a minute there's nothing on here hold mm -hmm. on a minute and adults starting to go you know, it's going, I'm unsubscribing until the Mandalorian comes back because there's nothing to watch. I mean, yeah, kids watching Frozen 2 over and over and over again is one thing, but you know, for you yourself, if it was just you without your kids, would you have subscribed? Probably, probably not. And I think that's where they they realized that that was a problem that they were going to have was the churn rate of adults was going to be too high if they didn't do something about it. And I think the lineup that they've got for Marvel is, is a way of keeping that the same thing with Star Wars, but they need more than that. They need the, mm -hmm. the Marvel. The, <clears throat> and I really, there was a big drought of that. There was also the library content really dried up as well. The, you know, they were doing all right for a while and then suddenly the, they just stopped putting in, you know, there's still a lot of shows. I mean, we have a list that mm -hmm. of our writers does and he, it's, there's like 700, six, 700 things missing from the vault, just from the Disney side, not including 20th century. It's, and they don't they were not really putting a lot in there they've gone through a lot of changes in how they release stuff you know we went from everything dropping at the first of the month to nothing dropping through the month and then that didn't work they started dropping documentaries weekly that kind of fell apart and they kind of did that as you know the monthly drop they now tend to you know they shifted then to having everything on a friday there's been a lot of moving parts of while they've been trying to work out what works and what doesn't um and i think that there's been a lot of like there has been a lot of frustration. I see so much of it in, in, in our community of things being missing. And it's only, the thing is, it's not stuff that I think the mainstream audience really cares about, but the fans miss, you know, 
there's a lot of shows from certain age groups that aren't there. You know, they, they, I think a lot of it's down to so many different reasons, but um, they've been lacking a little bit on the, the vault side of putting some things on there, whether or not that was down to COVID as well, of they couldn't get the people in place to put it all together or the cost. But ultimately, sometimes the library content doesn't necessarily bring in new subscribers. It, it might keep them. Mm-hmm. And I think Disney kind of had worked on that nostalgia base for so long, but nostalgia, I think, only lasts for so long until you eventually start going, yeah, I want something new now. And mm-hmm. I think in some ways, Disney kind of got that right, where I think with year two, where there's going to be a lot more coming up. Yeah, and I I, I agree that um, with the people with with kids, they, they obviously have a lot of the content, a lot of the library there. Mm-hmm um some someone like me i i was i was subscribing no matter what because of the library and because of everything that that's coming in um I, to someone who's kind of a casual fan a casual user it definitely you know i i could see you make a decision between disney plus um netflix uh, Apple Plus, now HBO Max, and all these other things that um, you brought up something that was really interesting that made me think. You, you said the uh, the weekly drops. Yeah. Um, how do you think people react to the, I guess, the Disney Plus model of let's drop it weekly? And I know when they initially did that, there was a lot of criticism over. Well, they're just doing this so they can. Yeah, they're they're going to do this because yeah. the Mandalorian's eight episodes so they're gonna at least have people subscribe in november december and january um but how do you think people have reacted to those weekly drops versus like the netflix model where you just binge watch everything i think there's a there's a there's a little bit of a generational difference you've got the kind of people that have grown up with a netflix model that think that's the way you watch television and that's the only way you watch television <laughs> it, it, and yes. like odie's like me and are like <laughs> well no we had to wait you know you have to wait weekly and um Therefore, to, to me, it's like the binge. The, I don't like the binge system because no one's on the same page. You know, I'm just like, I can't watch all eight episodes of The Defenders mm-hmm. when they all drop at once. Or, you know, and suddenly then you're all on different pages and you're like, well, where are you? Where are you? What are you up to? What are you? Oh, you haven't watched it yet. Have you not? Whereas the weekly system kind of keeps everyone on the same page. Mm-hmm. You know, everyone wants to talk about it then. You know, you kind of got the spoiler zone. We're trying to kind of get a few days away. And then, you know, everyone's on the same page. And then if you are behind, you can kind of catch up with everybody. You know, it is that water cooler moment that we all grew up on. Mm-hmm. That I don't think the Netflix generation kind of had that. You know, it's like, oh yeah, you watched all of it. Have you watched? And it's like the binge module has shown that it doesn't. I mean, look at Netflix. Quite often they'll release a series, and within two to three weeks, you don't hear anyone talking about it anymore. Mm-hmm. Because it's all been dust and dusted. I mean, maybe yeah, Tiger King lasted a bit, but The Crown, all these kind of shows that arrived, most people just plow through them, move on, and then mm-hmm. that's the kind of issue. The weekly drop keeps everyone like on the same. You know, Game of Thrones used to do it, and it keeps everybody on that same page. It keeps the discussion going. It's, as I said, like we got One Division for nine weeks or eight six, eight weeks, I think it would be. You know, they'll keep that discussion about one division for eight weeks as the main thing to yep. draw you in. It's not just this Friday. Oh, oh and Saturday, oh, next week you're gonna have a different. They can keep that momentum building. I mean, the whole thing with Baby Yoda when it launched was they were able to build on it. I mean, you look at like Mandalorian season two. That build, that building on building and building on episode on episode was building the anticipation. You don't get that with a binge, and I also think well, when you binge, you kind of can become a little bit blasé a bit you kind mm-hmm. of you, yeah. you get you kind of get dull off a bit in the middle and the weekly stuff keeps you entertained so much more and if you want to binge it and you don't want to pay for it all just wait a couple of weeks and mm-hmm. you can do it. <laughs> yeah well and I, I think the the dropping it weekly what i have seen is first of all i never i never binged watched anything so when we would watch ozark or when we do watch ozark we're, we might watch two or three episodes at a time, but that's that's pretty rare. You know, usually we're watching one episode, and a lot of times, um, I'm not watching a full episode, or I might I might be able to watch 20 minutes here, 30 minutes here. You know, it was really with with a show like The Mandalorian, is really the show that 
I blocked out time that I need to watch this whole thing. If, if I can, I need to watch this whole thing in one sitting. And I found myself because of the weekly drop and the weekly schedule, watching an episode maybe two or three times because that first time you watch and then the second time maybe it's you know the second third fourth time maybe you have it on in the background but you're noticing something you're yeah. noticing things you didn't notice the first time which is which is fantastic i'll be honest with mandalorian season two it got to that point of i used to watch at eight, eight o'clock because it dropped eight o'clock in the morning for us here so i'd watch at eight o'clock watch it first because it'd be along the lines of i couldn't go into the group or into social mm -hmm. media without and it was along the lines of i don't and it's like, i would be doing the same with one division it's like i don't want to be spoiled i want to so i will be watching it at eight o'clock in the morning because usually at that point i would be on checking to make sure mm -hmm. all the articles and stuff are going up but yeah when that drops it's like i will be on there at eight o'clock to make sure i can't have it spoiled because i can't and that's you don't get that with the binge you don't get that with other things and i do think that it does it has a different thing and, I, and you know amazon did it with the boys they shifted over to mm -hmm. weekly and there's a lot of sometimes netflix is getting a little bit along the lines of the weekly drop might keep you know, things like the um the umbrella academy and all of these kind of shows of would they have but netflix has kind of built themselves in this hole where they if they do it they get seen that this oh you're not us yeah disney have been making tv series for decades they know what what works i mean there's this kind of thing of you know, oh, you're the new company, and oh, it's like, no, these guys have been making television. Yeah. They know how to do TV and how to get your people. You know, they've, they've got decades of experience. It's just how it's being consumed. But they still know what they, you know, what they're doing. So, what do you think? What? How do you think Disney and the launch of Disney Plus, the presence of Disney Plus? How do you think that has impacted kind of the the streaming? entertainment industry and then just the entertainment industry as a whole well i think we kind of got i got two things there so first off we're going to do like with maybe like the the cinema aspect but then we kind of let the streamers up so i think the success of disney plus kind of maybe scared hbo and warnham into kind of being a bit more aggressive mm -hmm. and that they had to take this a little bit more seriously because they were a bit like tiptoey, like, oh, we're making some stuff, but cinemas and, you know, we're not going international. And then they realized, oh, we might need to kind of up our game a bit. Peacock, I mean, whatever Sky and Comcast are doing, they all seem to be, they still seem to be kind of clinging to their old system. <laughs> Much yeah. like, we don't want to, we don't, we don't want to go to streaming. We don't want to. Yeah. Um, I mean, CBS, you know, they look like they've completely like realized that they need to buckle down, change the name, become global and sort themselves out, you know, with Paramount Plus. And I think it's just put that competition in place of Netflix has come out strong. They put out a trailer this past week of all the movies coming this year and kind of they're being very aggressive. Amazon is doing the same thing. They always put Amazon in a different category. I never, it's like, um, than everybody else. But I think it's, it's suddenly now they're all taking it more seriously. They're all much more focused. They realize now that they need more kids content. You know, they all realize now that they need that more. And that it's a big, big aspect that they need to pay more attention to. And Disney kind of got that market and they're the leaders. And but it's good for Disney because that means if they've got competition, they'll they'll keep making better mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. So Disney need that. They need somebody, you know, maybe or not, it's not maybe universal cooking uh, now, it's Netflix, you know, and they know that they've got to kind of and so it makes everybody a bit better. So there's a lot of that going on. And then we got cinema releases and the movie releases. I think. I think COVID has kind of speeded up how movies get released quicker. I mean, I think they all want to go, I mean, most of them want to go back to the old system, but they know that they can't quite go back to it because we, you know, the old days of waiting nine months for a movie to come onto streaming, I don't think it'll work anymore. I think we've, you can't take it away once you've had it. Um, and I think they are, I wouldn't be at all surprised if this prem, premier access thing becomes regular and just becomes the standard. I mean, if they put it at a premium rate, they can kind of distinguish it. And if you don't want to watch it, you, you can go to the cinema to see it. But essentially now they're at the point of going, cinemas were going down even before the situation. And it's just speeded everything up. Yeah. You know, is was there too many cinemas? Were there too many screens? You know, did they need a, uh, you know, they might needed a kick because they got slack. You know, they were just cruising along 
and Disney were doing very well. That everybody, everything. But if you look at the movies before it, anything in the mid tier was not doing very well. Yeah. It was only yeah. really the big blockbusters that were put. So Disney have those events that they need, and that drives the merchandise, it drives the theme parks, it drives everything that goes around it. And I think we are going to see a change. I think we're going to see a speed up. You know, we might see how quickly they arrive on the streaming. I think Premier Access is going to be something that we will see a lot more of. And especially this year, I think they've all realized now they can't keep delaying. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion this past week of more movies being pushed back um, again. Whereas if they they can't keep doing it because they're filming stuff and there's a, they can't, you know, people aren't going to, even when we are all allowed out, we're not going to be able to go week in, week out, week in, yeah. week out because we, you, you can't afford it. Yeah. Um, so I think there is going to be a shift. I just think it's speeded it up. It feels like maybe like we've had like a 10 year jump. Mm -hmm. Suddenly now it's, you know, whether or not we get video on demand. I don't, I think the whole deal with HBO Max, they probably, I, Disney didn't need, they don't want to do that. You know, you can tell they still want to, they still want both, um, both parts. <laughs> they don't yeah. want it all in one. Well, and do you, how do you, or do you believe the, the premise that, um, like, is this the new model? Is this, are, will theaters not go away, brick and mortar theaters not go away, but will people only go to brick and mortar theaters for those big event movies or for something special? And otherwise they're watching on, I mean, I, I, the sell of, um, flat screen TVs is going to go through the roof because people are just going to keep buying bigger and bigger and they're going to turn um, their rooms in their house into home theaters, like big setup. Do you buy that, that that's kind of where we're going and the pandemic just sped all of that up? Or do you think we will kind of see this happy medium once theaters open back up? I think, I mean, I know personally, I mean, I brought myself a nice big 65 inch television with, the, with speakers and everything. Mm -hmm. And it is that thing of you're watching, you know, a movie like Safety, and it's just like I didn't, I don't need to see that at the cinema. Yeah, it's fine. You know, it's perfectly good. It's you know, it's a better experience actually than seeing it. Mm -hmm. You know, but a big blockbuster at the, on the screen. I mean, it's like even watching Soul. Did I feel like I, I didn't feel like I missed anything yeah. by it seeing it like that? Whereas, yeah, if when I go see Black Widow, I probably would like to see it on the big screen because I, I. I I, when I was at college, I used, I mean, I used to, I used, you generally would go to cinema every week. That was, I've always loved doing that. But you've got families now, the, the cost of cinemas have just gone mm -hmm. stupid that they can't afford to go. Um, so they're not going. I think you're always going to have cinemas in the big cities, especially in student, um, you know, large student populations. You know, there's going to be that art, you know, I remember going to the art house little cinema and watching, you know, Chinese uh, martial art movies and, you know, those kind of movies, there's always going to be an audience for that, but that's going to be primarily, I think, based in universities and that kind of thing. I think a lot of, there might be some, some of them closed down. Maybe they don't need as many screens. Um, the days, I think, of when I was a kid, when I went to see like Jurassic Park and the queue went around the block mm -hmm. to get into the, I mean, I've you've just not seen anything like yeah. that. You know, I remember that being, you know, being like that as a kid because you didn't have, you didn't watch it then. You could, you had to wait four years till it was on TV. Yeah. Back then. And like now that's not like that. You know, you, um, so I think it's all changed so much. I think there will be a place for cinema. I just don't think it's going to be the same way um, that it used to be. I mean, I know like so, you know, people like going to the cinema will still want to do it. But there's so many movies now. I think the mid the mid tier range, the low tier range, are just ain't going to be able to cut it properly at the cinema anymore. And we'll do, you know, I don't think we'll have a billion dollar movie for a while. Yeah. Do you think um, companies like Disney, um, Netflix, Apple, do you think they may start purchasing theater chains? to where you would have kind of, you know, like a Disney specific movie theater that the first two weeks is their movies are specific to there. And then after two weeks or three weeks or whatever it is, all of the companies are negotiating that, yeah, you can go to a different theater chain and you can see a Netflix movie or a Disney movie. Do you think that has any place in the future? 
I don't think I I don't I don't think Disney need to. I think they're at the point of going, well, we take sixty percent of the of the money, and if you're not there, we don't need you. We can go around you. And I think I think in some ways it's given them all a little bit of a kind of like, we actually don't need you. We can go around you. And I think it's kind of taken a little bit of the power away from the cinemas because they were all like, you know, they were stomping a lot about, you know, like we you're not going to do it's like, and you could see the cinemas going, the check the studios going, well, we're going to outlast you. So we're not, and you could see that that power struggle going on with Universal doing like their seventeen day thing, you know, you know, are they, they're not going to be able to go back to the old ways and just start pulling it back again. It's gonna it's speeded it up, and cinemas are going to have to adapt. And I don't know mm-hmm. if they've adapted quick enough. You know, the whole push to three D didn't work. You know, the and like I said, you know, how many of us have got big TVs at home that yeah. we don't really yeah. have that need to? And what do you? Also, what do you think as far as, do you think movie theaters will start um, negotiations to show original content or original shows, original streaming shows in their theaters? Like, do you, do you envision someone being able to go to a theater and watching season one, season two of The Mandalorian or going and being able to watch The Umbrella Academy somewhere? No, I, I think we're at a point now where they've moved, they kind of, essentially i would almost say now you're looking at the streaming they're looking at that's taking away the tv stations Mm -hmm. the tv channels and the cinema kind of things i don't think there's them i don't think there's the demand i don't think people will go they want your monthly subscription and that's what they want and i don't i don't know if audience would will watch and go and watch tv series i mean there's a reason why that didn't happen even before um i remember my local app you know they did like sherlock they showed that and it's like well they didn't ever do that again, so they can't have done yeah. that that well. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I can't. I can't see it because I think essentially now they've they've lost a lot of their p- power. Because by the time we get out of this, you know, we're going to be looking at eighteen months, and then it might take another year before mm-hmm. things start filling. Because I mean, I know personally, you know, I'm not going to sit there in, a, in an air conditioned room full of um, people for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I, I just can't, I think it's going to take a long time to get uh, that confidence back, at which point have they been able to survive? Well, and I, I've, when I've heard people talk about going back to theaters, um, Sean Gerber uh, of the MCU Fan Show is the one who said it, that it, it's a traumatic experience. Everyone has been through a traumatic experience during all of this. And so it is, what is, what's it going to take for people to go back to uh, movie theaters to go back to concert venues to go back to sporting events things like that that people have to and companies have to be prepared for that that that's it's going to take a long but time ironic, ironically the thing is that if they really say for example black widow at home for 29.99 i'd buy it i wouldn't go to cinema to see it would you buy it suddenly then i'm spending much more on the video on demand system than i would do if they mm-hmm. went to cinemas and that's to be honest, Mulan wasn't a good trial because there was so much other problems with that movie. I think we're going to see it with Raya where they're going to test it out a little bit more. And I think they will probably, I think they're going to do a test with Black Widow. I think they're going to run, they need more data mm-hmm. to show what's going on. And I think they're playing it safe. They aren't putting it out there that everything's coming to it, but I think they're going to test it. And ultimately, you know, it's the consumer's choice. The world has changed. The technology's changed or what we've got at home has changed i know my wife if i said to, said to i mean she, I don't, she doesn't like the price of the new ones but she hates the cinema she take, finds it uncomfortable she finds the seats uncomfortable you know there's people talking you know you've got all this I, it's like yeah we, i just think there's so many people that won't want to do it. but as long as they give the option that's where the difference can i think okay. that's where the, yeah. the good line is i mean it's like with you know what i mean nothing is i mean even wonder woman over christmas just didn't pull the people in yeah and you know the one thing that that i still am trying to find a way to wrap my head around or even uh, like come up with a plan to wrap my head around is this change in um i know bob Iger in his book talked about it's a change of metrics and it's a change of revenue that the fact that they were releasing all of these original movies um, they released Soul. Uh, thank you for mentioning Soul. They released Soul Christmas Day. That would have been a major movie if it were released in the theaters 
mm-hmm. without the pandemic because you know all most Pixar movies are the best Pixar yeah. movie that's come out right um and so kind of like what is the the metric uh that they're able to measure the success of Disney plus and because we're 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 locked in this old way of thinking that it's all box office money and it's all box office dollars. Hmm. Um, ha- have you been able to wrap your head around kind of how they're, they're changing their scope to look at here's how successful a movie like soul is when obviously if it were released in the movie theaters, they would have been looking at box office numbers. Yeah. I mean, the fact that so, I mean, I just did literally an article before we came on air um about so being the biggest streaming title of december it was the biggest movie biggest thing had an audience share of like 26 percent or something from the park seven data and so therefore it beat netflix mm-hmm. so therefore that is instantly a and these are constant things coming up it beat wonder woman i think as well um with some other data that came out from other companies so now there's all metrics now starting to come in of going have they got the biggest did they have the biggest day did they have more people watching it the key thing you hear is is new subscribers have the churn rate that is going to be the way that they're going to kind of try and work out the money you know it, they need that they're going to get used to that monthly money coming in and that's how they're going to and they need to keep putting things on there to keep getting it because mm-hmm. um you know you're paying eight bucks a month how often were you going to cinema were you going every single month to see a movie not every you know if you only go to the cinema once a year you wouldn't yeah. you know you wouldn't get anywhere near that and that's the difference um i think the big the you know the 200 million dollar bo- box office movies that make they make no sense to put on a streaming network you know um i think like james bond they were trying to sell that one the other week and they wanted like you know loads of money for it and the stream was only offered half and we're going yeah these movies aren't suitable for streaming mm-hmm. because the, the budgets aren't you know they don't pull in it and I think we had that Ryan Reynolds movie, the underground one, the race, it was like the Jimmy, the Jerry Brockham. Great movie. I mean, it was a movie that, you know, you would, you know, that kind of movie. But those big budget movies don't work the same way for streaming in the same way. And I think um, they need to go to the box office to make money. Um, they need, and I think it's just that kind of thing of, you know, you can see why all the big $200, you know, you look at last year's movies. What ones did they release? You know, uh, you know, the one and only Ivan, all the ones that weren't big, you know, they did it with Mulan because they essentially ran out of time on that movie. Um, but yeah, there were so many other problems with Mulan. That was, and, but yeah, the, those big movies they have to put back because they need them at the box cinema. Um, and and I, I'm trying to get through my list of, of things that I have written <laughs> down, but you keep bringing up stuff that I just want to go like in different <laughs> tangents. You mentioned the big box office movies and, you know, during Disney investor days, um, it was announced and it was written about after that, that um, the way Disney filmed um, the Mandalorian using the technology that they, that they used, they are building more of those facilities to be able to do that. Yeah. Do you think, this shift to streaming and the emphasis on streaming, do you think that's going to have an effect on how, not just Disney, how other studios also make movies and make their their big blockbuster movies even? I mean, so much is done in C- CGI now. Do you think that they are going to try to look at ways, cost-cutting measures, because there's the potential that these things are going to go to streaming, they're not going to be the big tentpole movie events that we thought of in the past. I think the thing is the volume kind of gives them the the rooms that they use with the big virtual reality things. It allows them to essentially go on location everywhere. The crew doesn't have to go anywhere. They don't have Mm -hmm. any of the costs of going. And the trouble is, is we don't know what the future is right now with the virus. You know this whole thing of we're all going to get the get this infected you know not the infection get the get the um, vaccine and we're all going to be back to normal again and everything's going to be fine again that might not be the case it might we might be jumping in and out of how it's all going to be working and stuff and so in some ways the volume is allowing them and that's why they're building so many of them at their studios is it suddenly takes all that responsibility takes it all away 
They don't need to go and do as much on location, saves on costs, saves on money, brings the budgets down. I mean, you know, you, you can definitely see that doing, I think they're doing it with a new form. And especially now you can just, I think the, the Obi-Wan Kenobi series was going to be a little bit more on location, but now they're using the volume. Um, I think it just, it's, it's going to allow them to kind of essentially make it on set. And again, technology is kind of doing something completely different. And it allows them then to maybe push it onto streaming because the costs have dropped. Mm -hmm. You know, they can suddenly they can be in this lo on a nice location, but they've not actually gone there. You yeah, know, and they have not had to fly out what 20, 30 people. I mean, they've still got a load of people going out um, at the minute to Budapest to film scenes outside and mm -hmm. do stuff outside. But they maybe don't need to do as much of it outside. Yeah. So they maybe only have to do a few things here and there. But they can't one hundred percent rely on the volume for everything. They still need to go, in. but it. They can reduce the costs it means it's more likely than they can you know they can do something with it with streaming yeah and you think other companies other studios will follow that example also oh i'm sure disney will license it out to, um yeah they, they were like lucasfilm um you know and last year and like uh, light of magic they work with all other moot companies anyway there's, yeah. there's a way yeah. of this to work and they can make money off of it even better you know if, if the movie's if other companies can pay them, they, they, they'll all work together when they come yeah. to money. <laughs> <laughs> um, to, to transition a little bit, um, I, I want to ask your, your recommendations for people who um, are watching something on Disney Plus. And you can, you can explain as much as you want about these, um, or you could just give me the, the titles for people. But basically, I want to, we're going to go through the difference the different brands on Disney Plus, in, including um, Star, which which is yes. not available in the United States, but is available um, internationally. And if you could give me two to three titles under those brands that you think somebody should watch, um, I, sorry to put you on the spot, yeah. but you, you you write about all of this, you know the original <laughs> content. Um, so. Under the Disney brand, and um, so if you're looking at the homepage, it is, you know, the, the Disney logo. Um, what two or three titles do you think somebody should watch? It could be the, library, it could be so with, or original. I, I was going to say, I was gonna say it was, that was the thing. It was the original library. So the thing is, like, so the Disney library is probably the biggest and the most messiest because it's all over the place. Um, in terms of an original, um, we've we've mentioned like the Imagineering story. I would throw. I would say actually, give High School Musical the musical, the mm -hmm. musical, the musical, the series a go, because I was kind of expecting it to be bad. It's a bit of a kind of a guilty thing of going. This is really bad, but I kind of like it. So um, definitely give an episode or two. Don't think of it as the original movies. It's it's completely separate. So um, another one. If you love movies and you love the thing prop culture. Mm -hmm. Rock Culture yes. is a really great documentary series taking a look behind the scenes of how movies are made. Probably definitely one of my top picks from the Disney side um, as far as the originals go. That, If you love movies, that's definitely a high up one. Okay. What about Lucasfilm, Star Wars? See, you got Mandalorian. Just it, We'll just put that one in there. That's straight away. Um, the Clone Wars Season 7 was a Disney Plus original. Just the whole, all seven seasons of them is a fantastic amount of content i got into it late i was one of those ones that went i remember going and seeing the movie when it came out years ago saw it on the cartoon network never bothered with it thought it was for kids and never and then suddenly um i play a lot of like um tabletop games and stuff like legion and x-wing and stuff or used to until you couldn't um and you know they all my all of my friends at the club were all like talking about these characters and these ships and stuff and i'm like well this is all clone Wars stuff and it's like they were like maybe five ten years younger than me i'm like that generation thing of going, I don't really pay, I didn't pay as much attention to the Clone Wars as I should have done, and rewatched all the series and then watched Rebels. Um, and this, the, the final season, that final four episodes with Ahsoka from earlier this uh, last year, was amazing um, to watch. But you have to, and it makes The Mandalorian better, and all these new shows, mm -hmm. you, it's it really does help with all of that. Um, as far as other Lucasfilm stuff, it's kind of you you kind of got Star Wars and then you really got only Willow. There's not really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I think I, I think I would throw maybe Re I would throw Rebels in there as the other thing to watch um, if you yeah because most people have seen the series. 
maybe maybe they'll maybe they'll work out um and get some more indiana jones get some indiana jones content on there who knows yes but maybe uh, yes. that's I coming think the job, in the yeah we've got indiana jones 5 will be on there but unfortunately the first four movies are distributed by paramount so they can't really do much with them yeah um marvel yes well as of i mean i'm gonna say now one division will be the big one to watch obviously regardless of it's going to be good. I've got no no worries about it being good. Um, so that's definitely there. Um, as far as other stuff that's on there, the original lineup was pretty poor. I mean, all the documentaries, the documentaries were okay, but they weren't. I would def, I would throw a little bit of a loop her thing here. I've been really enjoying Agents of Shield. Um, we're just currently get we're over here in the UK. We're getting like season seven weekly. I I don't think it's out in the US yet because of the Netflix deal, but if you're in the UK, that's definitely been, I've been enjoying that series the last few weeks. Um, and I'm going to throw a bit of cover up in humans. If you never watched it, okay. try it out. Don't, everyone pooped on it. It pooped on it so much because they wanted it to be, but as if you think of it more along the lines of like Arrowverse, you, it's, it's, it's not that bad. It's not, yeah. it's not as bad as everyone made out. <laughs> yeah. Well, and uh, again, like, you know, original, or movies, the existing content is fine. Um, what about Pixar? Pixar, I mean, Soul obviously has to be very high up and on that list of because it's obviously original, so newest movie. Very well done. I don't know necessarily if it's something I think kids are going to watch over and over again. I don't think it's going to be in that same line. Um, so I just definitely will put that one in there. Kind of in some way, think of as onward. As an original, because I watched mm-hmm. it on Disney Plus, because and I I think I enjoyed that more than Soul. I think Soul was a better movie, but Onward was much more for me. But for me, Pixar's um, you go into those shorts, go in and check out the short sections because mm-hmm. some of the the Spark short series are some amazing with some really great stories, stuff that you wouldn't normally see. Very good. You know, some people kind of question, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on backstage. When you watch the extras and stuff, they become even better. But there's some really good stuff in there. And I don't think everyone maybe checks out. I mean, things like Kitball. I mean, I was just like crying out. It was great. I mean, and if you know the, the history of Pixar and how they started and kind of just how every movie, every short is this advance in technology. Um, I love going back and watching the the original shorts you know before pixar yeah. was really pixar but before when it was um working with other studios on, on little projects here and there um before toy story came out um it's so much fun content to watch what what about on national geographic under that brand i have a feeling i know one show yeah the right stuff is an easy win just go watch it it's fantastic it's an amazing show um it's such a great drama series. I can't wait to see some of the other drama series that are going to be coming in the future. I think Genius is going to be. I've not seen them yet, so that's something I've been wanting to watch. So right stuff is definitely one. Um, thing is with National Geographic, there's a lot of content. There's a little bit more iffy internationally because of rights. Um, there's so many great shows on there. The things like um, Hostile Planet, if you like things like Blue Planet or any of those stuff, that's definitely a, a, a fantastic watch. I'm looking forward to watching the the new Cosmos that just dropped, I think, a week or two ago. I haven't got around to watching that one yet. Um, there's the Bear Grylls show that, and the Gordon Ramsay shows. I've been enjoying watching those. Um, again, this to me is like more traditional television that I would watch normally. Mm-hmm. And that's what I like about it. The National Geographic stuff quite often to me is like, that's that's what I would watch. That's, you know, what I flick on. I end up watching st- I end up watching most of the stuff on the National Geographic channel because I'm still in that zone but um, there's a lot of great content especially for adults I think it gets a little bit overlooked um, and then under again star is not available in the United States it's it's yeah. available international um, under the star brand well well first I guess I was gonna I was, to be honest I was gonna kind of yeah could you yeah, give in. a little bit of background of star and then the, the content? Yeah, because so Star is coming to Disney Plus in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, the UK, and across Europe. It'll also be coming to Southeast Asia, Japan, Hong Kong, etc. And this is going to be Disney's sixth brand within Disney Plus. It's going to contain all of FX content, ABC, Freeform, 20th Century Studios. So you're going to get Alien, Die Hard, 
you know, you're going to get all the, you know, so much content. I mean, essentially, I think we're going to be getting like a thousand titles within the first year. So essentially doubling the size of Disney Plus. Um, so I'm going to be honest, I am so excited about what they're doing with Star. I think it's the biggest jump for the app. It's all the problems of it being a baby one and nothing to watch. And nothing. Suddenly, this series is just going to, this app is just going to get, I think we're getting like, 35 original series in the first year, things like Love Victor, Big Sky, Hellstrom, or any, basically anything that's on FX or ABC is going to become like a Disney Plus original for mm -hmm. me. That's, that's, I mean, it's kind of, I mean, it's hard to say to, I mean, it's a re, it really sucks for Americans right now because I really am kind of a bit like, I'm so excited about it. Like, we're right, it's like, well, I've got to write about it all because it's going to be on Disney Plus. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, you know. These are Disney Plus shows now. <laughs> and yeah, it's like, yeah. Americans are going, not for me, isn't it? Like, yeah, but you, I, don't know, I, I do hate to break it to you, but America isn't the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> and there is a kind of thing of like, Amer Disney Plus is getting a massive upgrade. I mean, it's coming with a little bit of a price rise, but only like two pound. But I mean, when I say about like show, I am going to be watching so much more on Star. I'll be yeah. perfectly honest. And also, it'll be me and my wife will be watching mm -hmm. shows together on Star in the evening after work. And that is the big difference for me of the show, you know, when you, I mean, you had like Lost and 24 and all the rest of it, like, great, I don't want to watch it again. I've already sat through 100 episodes of Lost or whatever it was, I don't need to do it again. But I'm getting things like Grey's Anatomy and Good Doctor and Station 19 and American Horror Stories and you know, I think I wrote a story about like there's a Sex Pistols drama series mm -hmm. coming. But suddenly, then that's appealing to me as what I would watch on Netflix on Sky, or and it's really hard to explain, especially obviously Americans not getting it. Like going, look, we're getting Disney's entire thing here. Mm -hmm. We're getting everything that everything that we've complained about with Disney of not having the the adult stuff. We're getting. Well, well and, if. Yeah. if Correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of what is going to be on Star internationally is, I guess, outside of the United States, is a lot of the content that's on Hulu within the United States, yeah. plus yeah. the content, right? Well, this is it. I mean, essentially, it's everything that those, everything that's going through those channels would have got, will go to Hulu. Okay. Um, a lot of the Hulu originals are actually kind of brought in, so they're not necessarily made by, and I think they're kind of positioning them in the place of, getting it onto our, because the big problem as well over here internationally is we all bring in they're all bringing in quotas because like canada and australia and europe are or you've already done it where we need to have so much content created in mm -hmm. our regions yeah. for the streaming services yeah. to run and it's going to become more important so having the star brand means that they can chuck stuff in there and buy stuff and kind of throw it in under there under and it's not under the disney brand and it can help towards these quotas Hulu launching internationally wouldn't have been, they would have had to have done double the amount. And so they can buy maybe 10, five, 10 shows for the UK, and then that will keep the government happy. Yeah. You haven't really, and so it's going to really, that's where it's going to help them. And it's, it's like, I don't, I don't fully get the idea of why they did it in Latin America of doing it separately as Star Plus and putting basically ESPN Plus in there with it. It's a bit complicated, and I really hope that the numbers for international will help give Americans more content, because I think it's the biggest weakness of Disney Plus of not having enough mature, you know, not even just mature shows, things like Modern Family and um, some of these like ABC shows that are family, you know, this concept of family friendly doesn't mean it just has to be fine for a five-year-old it can yeah. you know a whole family can doesn't necessarily have to revolve around um teen you know little kids and i think we are going to see a change and i'm hoping the numbers from internationally might help americans get it yeah but america has also a bit of a different view of a disney than the rest of the world they've kind of got a very old-fashioned way of looking at it that they grew up on a different a different way to disney i don't know what there was a definite way that Americans look at Disney branding, um, especially like in the center, very differently to like how international companies look at, look at it all, and it's very strange. Okay, and, and I've I've really enjoyed reading um, some of the things you've written on what is kind of what sets Star apart and what what's going to be on there, and um, some of the the original things that are coming to there, um, mm -hmm. some of the things that I've seen on that. 
Um, what is your two or three titles that you would consider under the radar originals? From Disney Plus or from uh, Di from Disney Plus. So like the the not the Mandalorian, not the yeah. the right stuff. Those under the radar ones that people may have missed. Um, one of the ones I really enjoyed that kind of popped out first of, and I wouldn't necessarily it wasn't maybe the best one was Pick of the Litter, which mm -hmm. was a documentary mm -hmm. series about um guide dogs and how they get taught. Because when I was a kid, we actually used to have guide dog puppies, and we did that whole bit at the beginning, and they went off, and I kind of enjoyed watching it mm -hmm. and learning about how the process is and what they have to go through that was one of those series of like i know people aren't going to watch it but i was personally yeah like this is pretty good and i kind of liked it um there was another one was diary of a future president yeah. i hated the first episode i didn't really like the second and i kind of like, i've got to stick at it because it's an original and i'm just going to watch it and just suck it up and as the series went on i became more and more not necessarily with elena didn't really Fit with her, but it was her uh, brother uh, Bobby. His story mm -hmm. and his, you know, his issues. That was what I was actually was really enjoying, and it was a, kind of a show going because they're bringing it back for a second season. And I'm like, yeah, I'll, 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 mm -hmm. I'm in on it. It was definitely for me a show I didn't like, didn't give a good enough go, and went back to and liked. So uh, that was um, one there. I think it's for as another series. I'm just trying to think of because um, there's been a lot and. Some of them aren't really kind of. I mean, I did enjoy the secrets of the the magic of the, the, get the words right. Uh, the Disney of the Magic Kingdom, mm -hmm. not the Magic Kingdom, the Animal Kingdom show. I'm trying to yeah. get it all out. Um, the Animal Kingdom show was great. It was a little bit too fluffy. I would have liked a little bit more um, realism. It was a. It got sometimes. I didn't. I didn't really. Wasn't so keen on Josh Gad as a presenter. It kind of brought it down in terms of who it was aimed at. I don't. I. I there was something. Again, it might be an international thing of just like oh, if we'd had a different person, it wouldn't have felt so kiddish. But that was a good, that was definitely a very well made series, and I enjoyed watching the behind the scenes stuff of um, Disney. I'm just trying to think of if there was any other ones that stood out. Um, Marvel Six One Six was a very detailed yeah. series, but you kind of got to cherry pick that one. I wouldn't necessarily watch all of them back to back. Um, yeah, and Clouds again. Just watch, watch okay. clouds. Make sure you okay. watch clouds. <laughs> um, and you know the the under the radar series that that I loved. Um, although it, I, I watched it weekly when it came out, and it it helped because it came out at launch. Um, that I don't think a lot of people paid attention to. Um, there, there there was the the life um, according to. Um, oh, get remember. Jeff Goldblum. Yeah, that one was a yeah. great one. But also, I really, really enjoyed Encore, which I think is is a below the radar one that is is kind of for me personally. I just really enjoyed that. I thought it, it was fun to yeah. to see that, and it was an interesting concept that they were dealing I with. I thought it was a very good series. It was very well made. It was very done. The mine I did have a. I felt they probably could have done with splitting it into two seasons do six episodes and then drop another six mm -hmm. later because i think i remember getting to like the sixth or seventh episode going i've kind of got over this now i'm um i've kind of had enough of yeah. how it was working and the other thing that bugged me was like kirsten bell not being in it i um, well and it, i think <laughs> it was I think a bit like was in the first one and then maybe yeah, like never saw her, her again <laughs> yeah. and um it, there was a few good there was a definitely a few good episodes um i think you've got to cherry pick again if you like the musical or not um and it was kind of fun i think again being at that age group where mm -hmm. we maybe again we kind of connected with the idea of you know high school being like 20 20 odd years ago and you've kind of got these memories of it all and yeah and yeah it's it's it, it there's, there's definitely some good episodes it was yeah. kind of i think in some ways they they launched too many series at once. They could have, in rea in, in hindsight, they probably would have been better off holding off on Encore for the, the f after the Mandalorian. Yeah. Um, okay. So then, there the last thing that I like to do is rapid fire questions, and this deals with uh, just your overall fandom. So it, it there are questions. Um, a lot of questions deal with the parks, um, yeah. and then because of what we've been talking about, I, I have a couple um, thrown in um, from Disney Plus. But um, of all of the, the resorts, and when I mean resorts, I mean 
I'm talking about Disneyland, Walt Disney World, Shanghai, Hong Kong. I'm not talking about specific hotels. Yeah. Yeah. Um, of the resorts you've been to around the world, what's your favorite resort? Oh, that's that's so hard because <laughs> I, ha- I I can put my hand up and say I have been to all six. So it does make, it does make, so I can, it's that thing of there is good things about all of them. Um, it's for me, Walt well, Disney World will always be like my home park. That was the, that was the park I went as a kid. Mm-hmm. That's the one I would drop. I'm generally drawn to. It's got all the parks. So Walt Disney World is kind of that thing of that's always home. But I will learn, and I will say this to everyone, everyone that's a Disney fan. And especially if you only ever go to Florida. Please go and do the other ones. Please go and experience mm-hmm. the cities. Go experience something a bit different. Have a hot, have a break from Florida. Go and have a little bit of excitement somewhere else. Go see Tokyo, see the city, but also experience Disney from a different angle and feel that feeling of it being new. I mean, we did, you know, Shanghai and Hong Kong um, last Christmas, and that feeling of being somewhere completely different. And you know, it's it's similar, but it's different, and it really it makes it so much more exciting because you're not you know it's like you know when you have people that go to florida i mean i've been to i have been to the florida one probably about a dozen times so i'm in that category but i love the fact of being you know i want to go to the other parks i don't always just want to go back to that i don't want that same thing all the time yeah what about so now favorite gate of anywhere you've been I, um, I definitely feel as you're going into um, when you go into the Magic Kingdom in Florida, when you've got to catch the boat and you're on the lake and you see the castle and you see everything, that is that that feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that always kind of that feeling of right, you're back at Disney, you're back into it, and so that one always there. And also Epcot, when you see the when you go through and you see the dome, that just always just feels you just with like yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, it's true. Yeah. It, it is such a great way to when when the history of Walt Disney, the, the, the company and the man talking about um, trying to remove people from reality and have them in this fantasy world. I mean, when you like you said, when you have the park, go to a boat or a monorail and then there's that reveal. It yeah. does feel like, OK, reality is as far away as it can get, you know, um, uh, when you it, can see, for example, the Tokyo Castle from the highway, or or as you're coming up to the, you know, when you can see it from outside, it kind of breaks it. So that's the the, the reveal is the big thing. <laughs> yeah. Um. Anywhere you've been, favorite ride? Ooh. Um. I would probably say right at this precise moment, the Tron Cycle in Shanghai, which is okay. coming to Magic Kingdom, is an amazing roller coaster. It is so fast. Make sure you do have little legs because unfortunately I couldn't. So I had to go in the back seat. So I had to be struck and it didn't make any difference. I, lo- I did that one three times. I absolutely loved it. And it's always that kind of, again, for me, it's always about the new. I, the, you know, that or Pandora um, would be my, I like the new stuff. Mm-hmm. I love going on the old rides, but I always, whenever I go to the park, the first thing I've, I have on my list is what is new? What is the new stuff I've not done? Yeah. So those are the definitely in my top ones right now. And anywhere you've been, um, if you stay on property when you go to any of the parks, do you have a favorite hotel? Um, yes. Right now, I would say it would be the, um, what was it? This the, oh, I can't think of the name, but it's the, it's the Animal Safari Lodge. Oh, in okay. Yeah. Hong, not in, not in, in Hong Kong. I can't think of what the name of it is. Um, it is an amazing right on hong kong they've got it right on the on the water okay and it's all done up in like african theme a bit like the animal lodge but um it is it's all got the jungle dungs and it's good and there's just a feeling of feeling like you're in hawaii or in the tropics mm-hmm. and you you go outside and you've got this big walkway that go, lead along to the, all the other part and the hotel and you can see the skyline of hong kong and the beautiful waters and we had and we had such a lovely time at that resort um really loved it um that i yeah absolutely love that that place it was so nice okay do you have a favorite restaurant oof, oof. um 
I'm just trying to think of which ones we go to. Um, the last time I'm trying to think of what. I'm always partial, and it is. I think it's the the Harbour House in the Magic Kingdom. I okay. can get um the lobster roll. I know it's only yeah. like a a, a, lob, a lobster sandwich and some chips. It's like that's just so, that was always that's always been something I really enjoy when you know we found it one time and it was like we always now make sure we go and do it. Um, but there is the thing is, and it's really hard to explain to people. When I was a kid, Disney food was awful. You didn't go to Disney for the food because all you got was fries and burgers. Mm-hmm. And the first five visits to Disney World was just, you know, I mean, I did discover peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. <laughs> but in generally, it was, you didn't, the food was awful. Yeah. It's only really going as an adult where Disney have upped their game that now they've already got these restaurants. And, you know, we, you know, I love the Tapanyaki one in Epcot. Um, that's another, a really lovely restaurant there. That's kind of up there. But yeah, it's that kind of thing of, you know, I always remember it being so bad, but now there's so much stuff. And then you've got a lovely <laughs> yeah. cake shop in yeah. Epcot in the Germany, just with the Werther's original cakes. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. We always go in there as well. <laughs> we uh, we actually, uh, I, I frequent Harbor House as well. I like that. I, I, I like the, the menu at Harbor House and um, it's kind of, you know, the convenience of it and everything. Um, so in any of the parks, favorite Disney treat? Um, again, I'm going to go back to, um, there's this store in Germany in Epcot where it just sells Werber's original cakes of all different kinds, full of them. And they're just gooey, soft toffee and caramel. And it's just, I spent a fortune in there just (laughs) buying treats. Um, and there's not like one in particular. It's just, there's there's so, we usually buy a few different ones and we all ended up just like trying them all out. And like, Right now, if I was to have a treat, that would be where I'd go. And also, okay. I do like I do like the I, and that's a bit cliche, but I do quite enjoy the doll whip. <laughs> I, you know, this last time that we went was the first time I've ever had a doll whip, and I left the park having four or five <laughs> because yeah, is amazing. Oh, that was again. That was one that ever, it's like, I remember going like last time we went to Florida and going, all right, I'm having a doll whip. It's things, but everyone's going on about this thing, and it's like. It, yeah, it's only whipped ice cream. It's only a whippy ice cream. And I used to be, you know, used to have an ice cream van. So it's like, it's, it's, but it was like when it's 30 odd degrees and it's hot and you can sit there watching the tiki room with it, it was just like, that's the part of the experience. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so then rapid fire on Disney Plus, since that's what we were talking about. Um, favorite content on Disney Plus? Any of the, any of the brands, favorite content? Um, Definitely, I think I think the Mandalorian has to be the the, the, the one go to right now. Um, but as far as TV shows as a, as a brand as a whole, I'm probably going to go with um, National Geographic. Okay, all right, and then so, um, so. but yeah, thank you. And the the last one, and you could do kind of top five if you want. Mm. What are you most looking forward to in 2021 on Disney Plus? Okay, so. Um, we don't really know too much about the movie side, so there's um, all the stuff that they've announced so far um, for 2021. I think the five Marvel series obviously are in there. If I had to pick them, Loki, um, the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, also Hawkeye. What if the What if one is the one I used to like? But I used to like reading that comic book, so I'm kind of interested to see where they go with that one. The Book of Boba Fett. Um, I've always loved Boba Fett since I was a kid, since I had the little action figure. So I'm interested to see what they do with that character. Um, yeah, that, and I think also the big shot, something completely just random that I've got no idea what it's about. Yeah. Um, just something different. Well, and I, I will point out to people who are watching over your left shoulder, the the Boba Fett helmet behind. So, yes. the, uh... <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you so much for doing this um, and for for people watching and people listening, um, where can they follow you and follow the the content you're putting out on Disney Plus or about so Disney you, Plus? Yeah, so you can find me over at what's on Disney Plus.com. Find me on like Twitter, YouTube, uh, Facebook, etc. So if you're into Disney Plus and you want to keep up with all the latest, that's where you can find me. Okay. And Roger, um, this was a conversation I, I've wanted to have for a long time because I I love talking about Disney plus and kind of getting into a, I wanted to get into a deep dive and um, 
So thank you very, very much um, for talking with us today and um, giving us the content and then uh, allowing me to just ask you all of these questions that, I, that I've been wanting to get some response to and, and thank you. <laughs> yeah, so. no, thank you very much for inviting me because I, like I said, um, I, I, uh, my parents were very chuffed that I was asked to do something for the University of Memphis. They were like, what? So, well, I, you know, they, <laughs> <laughs> they were like, really? I was like, yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you very I thought this rubbish that I know about. <laughs> thank you very much and have a great rest of the day. Thank you very much, guys. Cheers. Bye.